Um, now we are recording. Uh, so these are some of the topics I'd, I'd like to go over. Um, the first one being pressurizing versus depressurizing ducts. Um, chapter 8 in the, the new ResNet standard allows for both unless you have a specific requirement in your your local area. Uh, we, we always recommend depressurizing the ducts. Um, the biggest reason being that uh, you won't blow any of the, the masking off of any of the registers, the supply or uh, return grills, um, which is a, a big cause of frustration among testers and, and quite often leads to uh, erroneous data. And uh, if you depressurize the ducts, you'll actually suck, the, suck all the masking on and get it as tight as possible, um, which is much quicker. You don't have to go around and, and check and recheck and make sure that nothing has blown open during the test. Um, you tend to get better numbers because you know, none of the tape forced its way open even a little bit. Um, so for these reasons, we, we recommend depressurizing, although some, some states require pressurizing uh, for one reason or another. Um, <clears throat> and also, if you're doing a duct leakage test to outdoors, depressurizing the house is, is also favor favorable. Um, it's, it's less disruptive. You're not blowing a bunch of cold air into a conditioned house. It's easier for the occupants to deal with that way. Um, but one thing you, you do need to worry about a little bit is uh, pulling, uh, pulling ashes out of the fireplace, which absolutely will happen if you depressurize the house. Um, so you can either vacuum up the ashes or, uh, or cover them with like uh, wet newspapers or something like that. Uh, that usually works pretty well. Um, and, and close the damper in the chimney, as I think it states in the ResNet standard. Um, right, so that's that's our recommendation for uh, for which test which test direction is best. Um, also, by the way, there there is the chat box, which maybe some of you have seen. Um, you can uh, type questions into it and ask me at any time. If anything I'm saying doesn't make sense or uh, you disagree, um, please let me know. I'm sort of hoping for uh, some discussion, especially during the extrapolation or, or which uh, neutralization method to use. Um, so yeah, I guess we'll get into uh, understanding extrapolation. Um, I'll just open up the chapter 8 draft. Uh, okay, so this is chapter eight. Um, right. So it, it for whole building testing, um, it does give you some guidelines for uh, what your what your minimum pressure needs to be. Um, I should find that section. Okay, so um, yeah, the maximum induced building pressure. Uh, this is, I think this is okay. This is a one-point test. Um, let's go for a multi-point test. Well, the, the maximum induced pressure must be uh, at least 15 pascals in order to actually conduct a test. But it doesn't actually say anything, I don't think, um, at least not that I can find, for what the maximum duct testing pressure is. You're supposed to hit 25, either positive or negative 25, um, in the duct test, but it never actually states, it says if you can't hit 25, it's okay to extrapolate your results to what the flow would be at 25, but it never says what the limitations are as to when you can extrapolate. Um, 
which I think is kind of a big oversight because if you can if you can only achieve five or six pascals in your duct and you're trying to extrapolate out to 25, you can potentially have some pretty huge errors. Uh, and this is not really addressed in the standard. Um, so I was just going to talk a little bit about what causes those errors and, and understanding extrapolation. Um, this will get a bit technical, so again, please stop me or say something if I'm going too fast or too slow or, um, or if you have questions. So I just made this little spreadsheet. Um, so actually I should first explain what the n value is, which we have in our DM2 operation manual. Um, Right, so this, this document, this is our gauge, the DM2, uh, the operation manual is available on our website. Um, well, I can send you the link later or you can poke around on our website and, and find it. Um, but this explains everything you need to know about our gauge. So I'm just going to go into the N value. Um, so the N value is what allows you to extrapolate to another pressure, a pressure other than the one that you're actually reading on channel A of the gauge. So the N value is a characteristic of the ducts or the house or whatever zone you're measuring. Um, any, any different house or duct system will have a different N value, but uh, typically it's, it's around 0.65 for houses and 0.6 for duct work. Um, I'll get into why that is a little later. But um, the basic equation for flow or leakage out of a duct system um, is the pressure in the duct system times a constant, uh, or sorry, the pressure in that duct system raised to an exponent, which is what we call the N value, and then times a constant, and that's equal to the flow at that pressure. So in order to find what the flow would be at a different pressure, you can go through this, uh, this math right here. Um, I guess I can zoom in a little. Oh, I see there are questions. OK. I didn't realize that, huh, interesting. OK, I am just now seeing where the questions show up. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. OK. <clears throat> uh, yes. Somebody asked uh, or commented that uh, when you depressurize, you can bring dirt and uh, other crap from the ducts inside the house. Uh, that is a good point, um, and should be should be considered. Um, I guess uh, you know it's okay to pressurize ducts, but uh, if you can. If it's a, especially if it's new construction or new duct work, um, we like to recommend uh, depressurizing. But if if you know that it's old and dirty duct work and got lots of dirt and dust dust in it, then uh, then you might want to consider pressurizing, which is uh, a very good point. Um, okay. And then somebody else, James, asks, when performing an auto multipoint infiltration test using software, can you explain how we determine the level of accuracy, specifically when it comes to the standard, reduced, or when to not perform the test? OK. Uh, section 802.6.9.
Sure, James, I can explain that. Um, okay. So the as far as I understand it, the reduced level of accuracy comes only when uh, well all right, eight oh two point six point nine. Let me just make sure I'm reading the right section. Okay. Yeah, so if the reported uncertainty in the corrected CFM fifty is less than or equal to ten percent then you have standard level of accuracy. If it is greater than 10%, then it's reduced level of accuracy. Uh, it doesn't actually list um, when you would not perform the test. But uh, in, in our software that we have, um, actually, I wonder if it's installed on this computer. No, it's not. Perfect. OK. Um, see if I can get a screenshot of it. Uh, basically, the, the uncertainty of the CFM50 is calculated for you in the software um, according to ASTM E779. It follows that calculation. And if it's within 10%, then, uh, then you've, got, um, you've got a standard level of accuracy. And if it's greater than 10, then you have reduced level of accuracy. Um, as for when you would not perform the test, um, yeah, people are wanting to see. James wants to see the uh, report. OK. <coughs> Sorry guys, this is uh, just our computer in our conference room and it doesn't have our software installed on it. Okay. So here's our software manual. Which should show some screenshots. Um, if I can get this to zoom out. OK. Oops. Uh, so, here I'll zoom in here on this screenshot. When you're doing your multi-point test, uh, there's your CFM 50, and it will give you a percent error right there. And let's see if we've got a sample report. Um, No, we don't have a sample report in here, uh, but uh, I can I can follow up with you guys and uh, and send out a sample report. Okay, but it it essentially has all the same information as the the main screen in Fantastic. It's just organized in a Word document. Um, Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. It doesn't actually say when you're not allowed to perform the test, a multi-point test. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I would say if you have an uncertainty greater than like 20% or something, then you, 
you know, it's, you're probably not going to get very repeatable results. But that's just my rule of thumb. That's not really listed in any standard. Okay. So, when testing ducts, this is another question from Kevin. When testing ducts located in unconditioned basements for leakage to outside, is there a need to open a window in the basement uh, so the basement ducts are closer to outside? This is not typical. Um, Yes, if you're truly trying to measure the uh, duct leakage to outside, um, you want to measure, you want to open up the basement. Um, so basically any, any unconditioned space that has ducts running through it, you should open up to, to vent to the outdoors. Uh, hopefully that answers that question. That would include uh, like garages as well. If, if the garage is not conditioned and they have ducts running through the garage, you should open that up. Any Anything that's not a conditioned space. <clears throat> um, okay, right. So, uh, extrapolation. So basically, you have uh, your n factor. Um, which is it's sort of a way to describe the characteristic of the leak. Um, all these all these equations are based on just simple orifice flow, uh, which is flow is equal to some constant times of pressure to some exponent. Uh, as to what that constant and exponent are, that depends on the size and the shape of the leakage. So anyway, and if you want to extrapolate flow at one pressure to flow at another pressure, like when you're using at 25 on the, on the gauge or, uh, or you're extrapolating by hand using the equations in, the, in chapter 8, um, you're, you're assuming you know what that exponent is, what the n value is. Um, and you may be pretty close, in which case you'll have a, a very good estimate of the extrapolated flow, uh, but you might not be. So this uh, is just a little chart I made. Um, so this is what the actual n would be. So let's say, for example, um, and this, this is your estimated n up here. So let's say I assume the n value is 0.65, but it's actually 0.55. So, and I'm trying to test at 25 pascals. So let's say I can only reach 15 pascals. So my error would be 5%. I would, if I extrapolated from 15 up to 25, I would get a 5% error by assuming my n value is 0.65 when it's actually 0.55. Now, most of the time for ducts, the n value is going to be somewhere around 0.6, maybe even closer to 0.55. And for houses, uh, it's typically a bit higher. It's more like 0.65. But not always. It, it depends. I have seen houses as high as 0.7, a little over 0.7, uh, or as low as 0.5. And you actually cannot get lower than 0.5 um, for well, because that's that's the the most basic orifice flow equation is is assuming a round hole in a flat plate, and that's the lowest possible flow exponent is 0 0.5, and the highest possible flow exponent is actually one, which would be 100% laminar flow, um, which you would never get in reality. Um, so anyway, this this is just a, a little guideline to see uh, how much error you might get when extrapolating um, if you're assuming a certain n value. So most of the time, for ducts, it's going to be around 0.6. For houses, around 0.65. And you might be wondering what the n value actually means. Um, it's kind of a way to describe the leak. So 
I drew this very crude picture, but it gets the point across. Uh, if you have a wall that is uh, thickness L, in this case I called it length, but so say the wall is, is this thick, and you have a little thin crack here through this very thick wall, um, and you're pressurizing to 50 pascals. The flow through this leak um, would be described by some constant, which is a function of the the area and the, the entrance characteristics of the the leak uh, times 50 to raise to some exponent. And that exponent is the n value. So a long, thin leak like this is going to have a higher n value. Uh, so if it's long enough and thin enough, you might actually, you'll, you'll approach 1 with your n value. And if you just have a just a, a wide open hole in a in a thin plate, then that n value will be 0.5. So in in a house, you tend to have a mixture of both types of leaks, and anywhere in between, you have hairline cracks and and big open holes. So your average n value for the whole house is somewhere around 0.65. Uh, duct tend to have uh, more wide open holes in very thin metal ductwork. Um, so the n value is a bit lower. The average n value of the ducts uh, is you know, 0.6, maybe 0.6, or uh, 0.55, somewhere in there. So that's the reason why uh, those two numbers are different, the 0.6 and the 0.65, which you can see in the, uh, the ResNet Chapter 8. Um, if you're extrapolating, if you're extrapolating for the uh, whole house test, it uses an exponent of 0.65, and for ducts, it uses 0.6, and that is the reason. So hopefully that didn't lose anybody. Um, Oh, I missed a question of earlier. Uh, can't get the units to pass the total leakage test for V3. Um, John, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by V3. Uh, hopefully you can elaborate. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, the most common thing that we see for uh, people doing duct tests that um, don't pass is uh, they forget to tape a uh, register. Um, that happens all the time. People call in and say they can't, they've sealed everything and they can't get it to pass. And they're so sure of themselves that they've taped up everything, but then they do another fourth or fifth check around the house and find some hidden vent that they didn't mask over, and that's what's causing the, the test to fail. Um, so that's probably the most common tech support issue we get. Uh, it also happens between pre and post tests. Sometimes they'll forget to mask something or uh, you know measure from a, a different uh, register on the post test and they'll actually show up more leakage after they've done air sealing and, and think that their equipment is wrong or it's broken and uh, it's it's actually just a, a procedural error. Um, so I suppose I should talk more about multi-point testing. Um, okay, since you guys wanted to know about that. Um, I guess, uh, where is that? All right. So for multi-point testing, um, most of this procedure is actually done automatically in our software. Uh, you know, you can adjust all of the uh, time averaging and uh, the pressure ranges uh, as much as you want in the in the advanced options um, 
you're essentially just doing a you're really just doing a, a test that's compliant to the ASTM E779 standard, except you're going from, I think, 60 down to 15 pascals, um, whereas ASTM goes down all the way down to 10. Um, but this this actually does allow you to go down to 10, I think, you're taking eight total uh, pressure and flow readings from 60 equally spaced down to 15. Um, but I believe your minimum pressure needs to be at least four pascals higher than your um, than the absolute value of the baseline pressure. I should probably install the software so I can actually show you guys this. Um, bear with me one minute here. By the way, our software is uh, free. You can download it from our website, which I'm going to do right now. You see the fantastic trial version. All you have to do is give us your name and email address. Uh, we're not going to send you spam. We just want to know um, who is actually downloading our software and keep track of how many people are using it. So OK. Now I will download our software. So just take a minute or two. I've got to install it. And really, if, if you're going to be doing multi-point tests, uh, doing it with software is, is by far the best way to go. You don't have to worry about calculating any standard deviations or t-statistics or anything like that. Uh, it just does it all for you. And it will run the fans automatically and, and collect the data automatically. Uh, it's just it's much easier. Um, if you're doing single-point testing, then uh, it, the software doesn't offer a huge advantage. You're just really you're only taking one reading when you're doing a single point test, um, right? So I'm going to go into the options menu, and you see I have Fantastic version 5.2.116. That's the latest. It says demo license. That means I haven't actually purchased it, and I'll get into that a little later. Um, and it expires. Uh, I think it's. Uh, yeah, it's a one-month demo. Yeah, that's a month from now, uh, May 24th. Um, so for the first month, you have access to everything, all of the features in the software. Um, so you can try it out and see if you like it. And then after that month-long demo expires, uh, it goes, it reverts back to Fantastic Light, where uh, all it all it is is you're just you're now limited. See, I have a whole bunch of different testing standards here. Uh, we're going to use ASTM E779, um, but you're limited to only one testing standard after the demo expires, unless you want to purchase a, a full-featured version of Fantastic. But uh, usually one standard is fine. Oh, and also you can only auto test with one fan, so you can't really do large building testing. Um, I'll just leave this stuff blank. So I've selected ASTM. I'm creating a new test file. Uh, this is what the main page of the software looks like. I can select a building image if I want. Um, 
to put in there. Um, I'm going to select RetroTech 1000 fan, uh, the DM2. Um, if I had one connected to the computer, I could find it automatically. Um, but anyway, uh, you've got your serial numbers, which you would need to enter in, test technician. All this stuff just shows up on the report. Um, building description, building address, customer information. Um, elevation and building height, that's used for, well, elevation is used for the elevation correction. Building height is just something that you need for the ASTM calculations. You've got uh, enclosure volume, floor area, and enclosure area. Uh, those are only used to calculate things like air changes per hour or uh, flow per floor area or uh, enclosure area. Um, but anyway, this is the uh, first data set. You've got your baseline pressures. You can take as many as you want for as long as you want. And then your induced pressures in the building and your test fan pressures, which will then be converted into total corrected flow down below. Um, oh, we've got uh, some more questions, it looks like. Um, how important is it to take and adjust the baseline pressure on the blower door before a duct leakage to outdoors test? Um, so in the duct leakage to outdoors test, you don't need to, um, it, it depends on where you're referencing. I guess if you're following the procedure that's written in, in Chapter 8 of the ResNet standard, um, then it shouldn't matter at all because you just, all you're doing is setting, uh, or actually no, they, okay, they reference to outside with the door fan and, right, okay. So yes, it does matter a bit. Um, so let's say you had a, a baseline pressure of plus one Pascal in the house relative to outside. So in order to induce a 25 Pascal difference, um, you would need to pressurize the house to 26 Pascals relative to outside, giving you a total change of 25. Um, then, uh, then you would set the pressure in the ducts relative to the house to zero. Um, so, yeah, I guess that. So that would. Um, so if you didn't, if you let's say you had a uh, that same one pascal baseline pressure, and you didn't account for it, so you just set pressure to 25 on your on your blower door and so you're actually only inducing a, a pressure change of of uh, 24 pascals so then the ducts would be measured at, at 24 um, which I mean really in most cases you're not going to have a, a huge baseline pressure so it wouldn't make a, a big difference but uh, yeah you should um, you should zero out the, the baseline if you're referencing the um, if you're referencing the door fan to outdoors, um, there are other ways to do it where you would reference the duct pressure to outdoors and then set to zero with the door fan. Um, in which case, you would actually you would need to ref or you need to cancel out the baseline on the duct gauge. Um, but you're 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 going to have to you're going to have to adjust for the baseline pressure uh, on one of the gauges, regardless. It just depends on how you have your pressures referenced. So I guess how important is it to answer the question? Um, it depends on how large the baseline pressure is. If it's like within one pascal, it probably won't make much difference at all. If it's five or six, then yes, you should you should definitely account for that. Um, but in my experience, you don't you don't see 
very often steady baseline pressures that are that high. Um, usually it will just fluctuate. It'll go up and down depending on gusts of wind and things like that. So um, it'll average out. All you need to do is just increase your time averaging. And then your, the actual steady baseline will not be that large. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, I'll get back to showing this. So I forget how many baselines you're supposed to take with ResNet. I think, is it just one? Yeah, with the blower door fan sealed off, uh, pre-test baseline with respect to outside for at least 10 seconds and then unseal. OK. So that's easy enough. Um, so in order to set up Fantastic for ResNet multipoint testing, uh, go into the Tools menu. And in the Advanced Options, you have the Settings. And this is for all the automatic test settings. Um, <coughs> so I'll, just, I'll go over each of these. Uh, cover fans before taking bias readings. Uh, if you select yes, then it will give you a warning to cover and uncover your fans before uh, before taking your uh, baseline readings and your pre and post test baseline readings. Show calculation warnings. This will tell you if you have incomplete or insufficient data or something went wrong during the test. Uh, I usually like to leave those on. Um, on graphs, you can include all individual readings or just show the average points. And individual control uh, doesn't matter unless you have more than one fan. I, I won't get into that now. But um, so you have your uh, airflow reference pressure, which you want to be 50 because you want CFM 50. But if you wanted to know what your flow was at 75 or 25 or whatever, you could change that here. Um, same for this flow per unit area reference pressure and leakage area reference pressure. Um, so for ResNet, you want to take one baseline pressure for at least 10 seconds. So you could enter 10 here. Um, but if it was windy and you wanted to take it for longer, you could easily do that. I, I mean, I could even do it for 300 seconds. I could take a five-minute baseline. Um, and then you want to take, I believe it's eight induced pressures from 15 to 60. Uh, I think they're supposed to be for the same amount of time as your baseline. Um, yeah. Where does it say? I'm not sure if it says. Oh, no, using the same time averaging period used in the baseline collection. So whatever this is, make it the same as the baseline average. So we'll say 30 seconds. Uh, and then this other stuff is just for, uh, well, it's for how fast the auto test will take data and when it will decide that the pressure has stabilized. And usually, you can just leave it alone at the default settings. So anyway, I would click OK there. And uh, assuming you've got all your equipment set up, uh, all you need to do is click Begin Automatic Test. And I actually don't have a fan or a gauge connected right now, so that won't work. Um, but that's what you would do. And then it would, it would start uh, taking baseline readings. And then once it's done, it will give you a message that will tell you to unseal the fans. And then it will start pressurizing. It will start with its, uh, its lowest target, which is 15. And then it'll go all the way up to 60 over 8 points, evenly spaced. And then you will, you'll get all your results down here. You'll get airflow at STP with your, uh, your error. Uh, at 95% confidence. 
Um, if you want your air change rate, you've got that too. Flow per unit floor area, flow per unit enclosure area, if you need any of those. It also calculates equivalent leakage area and effective leakage area, which are needed in some other standards. Um, but I don't think they're required for ResNet at all. Um, and it will actually calculate what your end value is. So if you're, if you're just using the at pressure on the gauge, you're, you're guessing at it. Um, but this actually, because you're taking uh, several flows over different pressures, you can actually calculate what that flow exponent really is. And so you don't have that extrapolation error. But uh, if you're just using at pressure in the, in the gauge or using that equation in, uh, in Chapter 8, um, where is that equation? Well, anyway, it's, um, it's pretty simple. It's, if I can find it. Um, maybe I can't find it. Ah, here it is. So it's just your target pressure divided by the pressure you actually reached. Uh, this, that should be an exponent. Um, that's very important. Uh, and then times the flow that you measured, and that's your extrapolated flow. But that's just, again, that's just guessing what your end value is, whereas if you do a multipoint test, you can actually calculate it. So that would give you a, a more accurate representation of what the leakage actually looks like in the house. Uh, and you can also, you can do a multipoint test on duct systems as well. Uh, I think there are some standards that require it. Um, I don't remember the names off the top of my head, but um, that is also possible. And then you can actually calculate what the end value of your ducts are. So um, what else should I talk about? Um, Oh right, the uh, the methods for uh, doing duct leakage to outdoors. Um, so in the ResNet procedure, I'll just go to that. Um, I believe they have you uh, pressurize the house first with your fan to uh, an induced pressure difference of of uh, 25, um, and then you're just measuring with duct fan gauge um, the pressure difference between the house and the ducts, and you just set that to zero with the duct fan, uh, which is fine, and that works, um, but uh, the uh, there are drawbacks to doing that. Um, so do that. Uh, for one thing, you can't you can't use the at pressure extrapolation on the gauge um, because well you you end up getting a divide by zero error if um, if the pressure on your duct fan gauge is zero. Um, so you can't do that. Uh, and also, if you want to get a leakage area, if you want to measure like the square inches of, of leakage in your duct, um, you also can't do that for the same reason. You'll get a divide by zero error in your gauge. Um, so there are, there are ways around that where you can do the calculations by hand. Uh, but that's, that's just um, that's one of the, the downsides to setting your duct fan gauge to, instead of to 25. Um, the way that I like to do it is uh, tie both the, um, the the red tubes, the outside reference tubes together, 
for the, the two gauges, the door fan gauge and the, the duct tester gauge. Okay, can, can you guys hear me now? Um, all right, sorry about that. My headset died. Um, just using a speakerphone now. Uh, okay, I'm back. I'm not sure exactly where I was cut off, um, but I think I was going over the, the different areas you can reference when you're doing duct leakage to outdoors. Um, Roar Roy is asking for leakage to outside testing. Please confirm that access doors are open to conditioned volume, such as areas behind knee walls where the rafters are insulated. Uh, yes. So let's go into that section. Yeah, so the, the entire conditioned volume um, you want to set up as one continuous zone. So you're achieving the same pressure everywhere throughout the zone. So, yeah, so, yeah, uh, that's a good point, John Turnus. Is, uh, that includes attics. Yes, if the attic is part of the conditioned space, uh, you need to open up the attic when you're doing a leakage to outdoors test. Uh, connect, or open up the attic to the to the house. Um, so make sure it's connected and all at the same pressure. You're trying to create a single zone inside the entire conditioned volume. So conditioned crawl spaces or attics uh, need to be opened up into the rest of the house and closed to the outdoors. So any, any uh, vents or intentional openings in those spaces that, uh, that can be closed should be closed. Does that uh, answer that question, hopefully? Okay, good. So uh, I forgot what else I was talking about. Um, right. So you guys understand uh, there there are different ways you can test. I guess if you're, if you're just going to be testing complying with this ResNet standard, then you have to do it in a certain way. Um, but there are other ways to to do a leakage to outdoors test. Um, all you're trying to do is is make sure that the 
the duct and the house are at the same pressure. Um, so you can either measure the pressure difference between those two zones and set it to zero, or you can set both of them to 25. Um, it's, both should give you the exact same results. Um, it's, uh, I, I like to actually just set both to 25 because um, then you can, you're can you able to use the at pressure extrapolations on the cages. Um, you're able to, to get a leakage area measurement. Um, and it just, I don't know, it, it always made more sense to me that way. Uh, but this, this standard, it seems like, restricts you to just doing a, setting one zone, setting the difference between those two zones to zero. Uh, does it matter if depressurization use, is used, asks Joshua. Um, uh, I assume you mean, like, if you're doing a duct leached outdoors test, does it matter if you're depressurizing or pressurizing? Um, no, not as far as uh, the accuracy is concerned. Um, you, it's just you're, you're now depressurizing the house, and uh, so you need to be aware of, you know, pulling ashes in from the fireplace, uh, if you're depressurizing, um, or if it's you know if it's a really cold day and the you know people are still in the house, maybe they don't want you blasting, you know, 6,000 cfm in, into their house of of freezing cold air. Um, these are things to consider. Uh, but in terms of the procedure, uh, it doesn't really matter. All you need to do is just turn the fans around, and obviously make sure both the fans are going the same direction. So if you're pressurizing the ducts, pressurize the house. Um, that may seem obvious, but I've seen it happen before where they, they mess that up. Uh, and then you, you get some interesting results. Um, John wants to know, when do you use the low flow ring? Uh, that would just be for a very tight duct system. It only goes up to about uh, 50 CFM, I think, maybe a little more than that. Um, and it, it'll measure accurately down to, I think, like, 5 CFM. Um, so if you have a very tight duct system and you have to use the low ring, uh, then that's great. That means you've done a good job making it airtight. Um, it's, uh, you know, we, we sort of use as a, a rule of thumb, if, if you have to use the low flow ring, you probably passed whatever requirement you're trying to meet. Uh, if you have to use the full open range of the duct tester, then you probably failed whatever requirement you're trying to reach. But um, that's, that's just kind of a general rule. Uh, you should definitely still take a measurement. <coughs> um, so the, the way you would know to use the low flow ring is if you're on the mid range and you, it either says flow too low on your gauge or you just can't get to 25. Like you're you're running at the minimum speed, and uh, you know you're you're still at 30 or 35 pascals in the ducts. Um, then then switch to the low range. Um, any rules of thumb to pass the total leakage test? Uh, I guess <laughs> make sure everything is sealed up. Um, I prefer depressurizing because it sucks the, the grill mask on, the, on there and uh, won't give you any extra leakage that you don't need. Um, make sure you get all of the registers taped off, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there can be ones hidden in closets sometimes, things you don't think about. Um, again, that's just that's a really common tech support call we get, you know, where someone is saying that they, you know, they can't get any pressure in the ducts. They've got the fan cranked up full blast, and they're still only getting five pascals. Um, it's probably a good sign that uh, something is not taped over. Or in some cases, uh, there's just a huge disconnected duct, like up in, a, up in an attic somewhere or something. You know, but the duct literally just kind of split apart and is just blasting into the attic. Um, so that would be uh, something to watch for as well. 
you can actually you can sometimes tell uh, where or get kind of an estimate of where the most of the leakage is by uh, checking the pressure inside each register separately and whichever one has the lowest pressure um, is has a leak near it um, especially if, if you can't if you can't get much pressure inside the ducts and you go over to some register on the far side of the house and you're only and you're getting virtually no pressure inside there then there's probably a big open leak between the fan and and where that register is um, so you can kind of go around and, and spot check and, and find where some of the leakage is uh, recommendations on diagnostic testing using theatrical smoke. That's yeah, that's a good idea. Um, you can get a theatrical smoke generator and and pump a whole bunch of smoke into the duct system. Um, if you're going to do this, make sure to notify the neighbors first and probably the fire department as well. Otherwise, you might uh, you might be talking your way out of some trouble. Um, you know, if, if the neighbors see a bunch of smoke pouring out of the, the attic or something like that, um, they might call the fire department, uh, which is not good. But, uh, no, that, that's a great way to find leakage. Um, you can pump smoke through the, the duct tester while it's running, while the ducts are pressurized, and, and see where it comes out. Um, that would be my only warning on that is, yeah, just make sure people know what's going on before you do that. <clears throat> um, I guess uh, if anyone else has any questions, please let me know or anything else you want to talk about. Um, Thoughts on dealing with zone dampers. Uh, I think it actually says what you should do with them um, in this in the standard. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to find this section. Yeah. Uh, 803.3.7 zone and bypass not, not balancing dampers should be set to the open position to allow uniform pressures through the duct system. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, yeah, that makes sense. You want the same pressure throughout the ducts, so if there are any zone dampers, just set them open. It's pretty simple. Um, Yes, most zone dampers are, are normally open until they're energized. Um, is there a percentage for leaky cabinets? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Um, okay, what's your take on duct mask versus the various ceiling systems out there? Uh, I mean, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, in, in depressurization, you have more options. Um, I mean, I've, I've even heard of people using saran wrap because it just gets sucked onto the onto the grills and uh, and registers. Um, you hardly need any adhesive at all. But if, if you're going to be pressurizing the ducts, um, you'll need quite a lot stronger of an adhesive to actually stick on there when you're when you're pressurizing it and not blow it off. Um, you do need to be careful. You don't want to pull people's paint up or uh, or leave marks. Uh, the the grill mask that we sell works pretty darn well. Uh, it's not it's not going to pull paint up in most cases you know, unless the paint is already flaking off. Um, I'm not trying to do a sales pitch here, but uh, we we found that that works quite well, um, and we sell it with all of our duct testing systems. Uh, there are plenty of other similar products out there that are that are designed to you know, to mask things off and, and not not pull up paint with it. Um, but again, if you're if you're depressurizing, then you you have more options because you don't you're not 
you don't really care that much about the adhesive. It, it doesn't need much adhesive. Um, <clears throat> so that's my take on duct mask. You know, or you can also you can make your own. You can tape plastic bags over it. I mean, any, whatever works really. Um, especially like for total leakage, the, the better you seal it, the lower your leakage is going to be. So the more leakage, the more airtight of a seal you can create, the better your results are going to be. Um, but if you don't make a good seal, then your ducts are just going to look leakier than they actually are, which you know is fine for compliance testing. It's just going to be harder to meet your target. Uh, any experience with AeroSeal for duct sealing after the installation? Um, I don't have a lot of experience with, with AeroSeal. Uh, I, I could find out some more information for you if, uh, if you have specific questions about it. I know we, our company has worked with AeroSeal in the past, um, but not me personally. Um, so I guess if, if you want to get back to me with, uh, with specific questions, I can, I can probably get answers for you, Josh. Um, any best practices? for testing when the air handler is located in the hallway closet and the closet is used as a return plenum huh. uh, with fresh air provided to the closet. This is multifamily, OK? So hmm. All right. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't you? I think I'm understanding this right. Wouldn't you just open up the closet? Um, I mean, the the hallway closet should be part of the uh, part of the conditioned space. Um, it seems odd to me that it it wouldn't be included in the conditioned zone in an apartment. So you have a closet with an air handler unit. Um, oh, the, okay. The closet only opens to a common hallway. Okay, that makes more sense. Um, hmm. I guess you could uh, you could open the closet door and put uh, put. Uh, an aluminum frame and, and cloth panel in there, and then and run the duct test from there. So you're, uh, um, we we do sell a, a cloth panel that fits over our duct tester. So you're you're essentially pressurizing the whole closet as part of the um, part of the uh, <coughs> uh, return plenum, which I guess would be what the ResNet standard would ask you to do is, uh, is put your mount your duct tester in the, the largest uh, largest return. Um, so yeah, you would open up the closet and, and um, put the door frame in that. Um, Corollary to duct mask, do we care what is leaking the duct work itself or maybe also the register not fully sealing to the jib or the floor? Um, yeah, it does matter. Uh, basically, you just um, you want to, uh, you know, if, if it's just leaking around the register, that's not as much of a problem because that's um, likely going to leak into the conditioned space. Um, essentially, any any leakage that's not into the conditioned space is, is what we really care about. So if you're if you're doing a, a leakage to the outdoors test, then um, most of that leakage around the register um, would probably not show up because it would be neutralized by the door fan. Um, uh, if it's an atmospheric combustion warm air furnace, wouldn't that be a problem? Um, I'm not sure why it would be. Um, you would be you'd be turning the furnace off, 
uh, during the test, for one thing, um, if you're worried about combustion gases or anything like that. Um, what what other problems would there be with it? I'm not I'm not super familiar with uh, with different furnace types, so you guys might have to fill in for me here. Also, um, do, do you guys have my email? If you want to email me specific questions later, um, hopefully you do. Um, let's see. I'll just type it here. Okay. Um, I put it in the chat window, which is different from the questions window. Um, but it's just it's my name, Denali, D-E-N-A-L-I, at retrotech.com. Um, if I, if you feel I have not answered your questions sufficiently, or you have other questions later, uh, feel free to ask me, and I can get back to you. Um, but in the meantime, is there anything else? Any other questions you guys have? Anything I didn't cover that you want to know about? Um, specific to our equipment or uh, procedures? I guess I'll leave it open for uh, a few more minutes, but I, I've got no problem ending a few minutes early. If you guys are, uh, oh, here we go. Um, many of us assume that the air handler box is a big leak, or is there any data on this? Um, not that I have seen. Uh, I mean, you could always uh, you could put smoke in and uh, and see what happens if you if any. Uh, Smoke comes out of the air handler box. Um, but there, there might be data. I just, I, I haven't seen any studies on it. Uh, the slides, um, yeah, I guess there weren't that many slides. I just had that uh, n value error extrapolation spreadsheet um, and just a list of topics I wanted to cover. Um, and I, I showed a, a bit of our software. Um, so yeah, I, I can send anyone the spreadsheet that wants to see it. Um, and then I just read stuff from the uh, uh, chapter 8 of the ResNet standard anyway, um, which you guys should probably have. Um, but yes, I, I can send it to anyone who wants it. Um, just please email me. Um, oh, right. Also, there's a recording, uh, as Lori reminds me. We are, we are recording live right now. Um, so hopefully that, that should all be made available on the, on the website. Um, but anyone who wants the spreadsheet or uh, instructions for how to download a, a free version of our software, um, please email me and, uh, and I can tell you. Oh yes, Sylvie did mention equipment discounts. Um, you should talk to Sylvie about that. I don't know anything about it. Um, I, I've heard that there will we are offering discounts to uh, uh, to your members. Um, I don't know exactly what's involved. Um, so contact uh, Sylvie at retrotech.com. Um, I'll just.
type in response to this. showed her email address there. Hopefully you can see that. Um, she knows more about it than I do. Um, the error graph spreadsheet. Uh, do you mean the, the one with the n value extrapolation errors I was showing earlier? That is, that's not part of the software. Um, I, can, I can send that to anyone who requests it. Um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's a similar chart uh, in our manual, um, in the DM2 manual, I think. Um, but yeah, I, I can send that spreadsheet. Uh, just uh, send me send me an email, uh, Denali at RetroTech.com, and ask me for it, and I'll email it to you. to. Got uh, another 15 minutes left. If anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. But uh, I, I think I've covered everything that I, I really wanted to. nobody. contact me. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. Um, and uh, <laughs> that is a good point, Josh. No one can interrupt me. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for stopping by. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll talk to you guys soon. I will uh, I'll make sure to give Colin a shout out. And Josh, I'll just remind you that I am not Colin. <laughs> and thank you for defending Retrotech. Much appreciated.